the click and hide ahead um, tribal methods for identifying use of land through tribal um, the tribal system. Well, when the Americans or, or outsiders came in, they just disregarded all that and they they begin to run roughshod over the, the use of the territory. In fact, they were pushing Indians away off of the land they had. Uh, so they were really being, uh, it was a new event that just totally devastated their notions about the use of, uh, of uh, natural resources. The commissioner set a sum of 15 million, he said, and he recommended that this be the settlement that the Tlingonites were entitled to. The full bench of the Court of Claims decided that Tlingonites should be entitled to a settlement of 7.5 million. This amounted to shattering the dreams that uh, the people who had s supported that effort all these years now were asked to forget about 80 million, forget about 57 million, and accept seven and a half million. There was anger, there was frustration, there was a feeling of deep resentment and passionate resistance to any suggestion that we accept that settlement. Uh, many people considered it uh, no more than an insult to the rights that the Tlingenheiters had asserted to their lands from time immemorial. The tribes uh, in our area had very strong caste systems and uh, I believe that um, when you have a great deal of respect uh, for your elders and a very high expectation of the youth, uh, those are the kind of things that uh, uh, set the stage for success for the long term. We live in a parallel culture, meaning we live in the Western civilization and we live in our Klinkit Haida Simpson culture, and we need to be able to take the very strength and depth of our culture and adapt them into the business that we're doing. And I think that really strengthens our place in the business world as we move forward because of the cultural strength we have and the respect that it garners with our customers and our competitors around the world. We are the Clinket and Haida Indians like the salmon that run through our waters and the eagles that soar through our sky. We belong to Southeast Alaska. This is our home. This is our land. From time immemorial, our ancestors lived and died here, and we assert our tribal ties to this land forever and always. This beautiful land in what has become known as Southeast Alaska stretches some 350 miles long and 120 miles wide and includes the entire Tongass National Forest, Glacier Bay National Monument, and the Annette Island Indian Reservation. Over 21 million acres of towering mountains, endless coastline, and pristine forests where wildflowers load deep green valleys and salmon choke summer streams. It is the largest temperate rainforest in the world. Our people thrived in this place. In the deep forests, we took cedars and spruce trees for our totem poles, canoes, and great houses. And on lush hillsides, we picked berries from bushes weighed down with their fruit. But it was the sea that truly made us wealthy. Our seal, sea lion, herring, and halibut, shellfish, kelp, and seaweed were all harvested from our rich waters. But most abundant of all were the salmon. They came bursting into our waters every summer in countless numbers, triggering events at the core of our clan and tribal existence. The movement of entire villages from their winter locations to clan summer camps for fishing, hunting, and food gathering. Our surplus of natural resources contributed to clan wealth and led to extensive trading among Clinkets, Haidas, and all neighboring peoples. It allowed us to create a complex society with one of the most remarkable cultures the world has ever known. In everything we did, our artistic sense was expressed. 
Just look at the celebrations we have today and you can see our love for all art and beauty. It has always been our way. This great land, bursting with vitality and beauty, inspired our ancestors. Their great love of life came out through carving, painting, and weaving. Even in the making of everyday objects like baskets, great care was taken to add exquisite designs. This carried through to the building and dedication of a house or the raising of a totem pole. Everything was done with an eye for beauty and a sense of awe at the world around them. In dignity and respect, we honored our ancestors and celebrated our place in this world. We did this through our ceremonies and celebrations like the memorial potlatch and totem pole raising. These special times were full of dancing, singing, and feasting. In full regalia, we sang the songs of our clans and told stories handed down from a time long forgotten. And while our children were still young, we taught them these special songs and stories, and they too joined the dance. We understood that a culture such as ours could not exist without a strong society and legal system. It has always been our way to divide ourselves into two groups or moieties, the eagle and the raven. When marrying, it was with a man or a woman of the opposite moiety. We were also divided into clans, house groups, and families, but it was the clan that took precedence over all else in the life of our people. All of its members were bound together in the closest union, where the honor and well-being of the clan were everything. Each member was a defender of the clan, willing to sacrifice life and possessions if it was required. Ownership or title to land was never bought or sold. It was obtained through inheritance or as a legal settlement for damages and was generally held in the name of a clan. The property of the clan included special names, crests, and songs. It also included specific land and water areas, such as fishing streams, hunting grounds, and sealing rocks, and inland trails. A highly developed system of reparations and respect for tribal and clan leadership provided order for our people. When appropriate, offenses to our laws were handled with diplomacy. But many times, negotiations were not enough. It was at these times that the fierce nature of our people came out. Early Europeans described us as courageous, daring, and alert. We were a warrior people, prepared to aggressively defend our rights, not afraid to die. We abandoned ourselves to the heat of battle and attacked our enemies at will. This is why Russian fur traders, so dominant elsewhere in Alaska, were never able to subdue our people. Three years after the Russian settlement of Sitka was established, we burned it down, destroying the Russian station in Yakutat as well. In 1805, we allowed them to rebuild in Sitka, but they held no control over us. We continued to live independently like our fathers before us, acknowledging no foreign authority and trading with whom we pleased. In 1867, Russia sold Alaska to the United States for $7.2 million. This obscene bargain unified our tribal leaders who asserted our ownership of Southeast Alaska and vigorously objected that Alaska had been sold without their consent. Russia could not sell what it did not own. Some of our more warlike chiefs urged aggressive measures to drive the Americans out of Southeast Alaska, but others urging peace prevailed. At first, white miners and fishermen paid us on demand for what they had taken. But that did not last, and soon our fishing and hunting and timberlands were being violated on a massive scale. From 1869 to 1912, efforts to stop the theft of our land fell largely on deaf ears in Washington, D.C. and Juneau. We were promised congressional action, but the timing was vague and no true commitment was made. Americans built canneries right on some of our tribal salmon streams, and miners forced us off land we had known since birth. The injustice was never more eloquently stated than by Chief Johnson of the Taku. 
we find our country, Alaska, overrun by white men who have crowded or driven the Indians from the fishing grounds, hunting grounds, and places where their fathers and grandfathers have lived and been buried. In 1912, a group of our people came together to form the Alaska Native Brotherhood. In the first years of A&B, discrimination and prejudice were main issues. Richard Stitt, self-governance director for the Central Council and former A&B Grand President. In Juneau, they, they, they decided to boycott the theater because there was a practice of uh, establishing two sides of the building, one for whites, one for natives. And uh, they decided to boycott and not uh, take their business away from them. And, and uh, that changed immediately. And they began to develop a political power that, that that the rest of the state was beginning to notice. This growing political power helped AMB to bring an end to the two-school system and to abolish fish traps. It also led to the recognition of our right to vote and probably the most well-known accomplishment, the land claim settlement. AMB's first president, Peter Simpson, was a strong voice for land claims. He had experienced the loss of land on a very personal basis. Peter Simpson was a, a, uh, a Simpson who, as I understand it, originated in Canada. In John Hope's history, he says that Mr. Simpson uh, was uh, uh, deprived of land. Uh, he couldn't own his, his home there, so he, he felt uh, that, that that wasn't good for, for Indians. So he migrated to Metlakatla. And I guess the same thing happened there. And then eventually he goes over to, uh, to Ketchikan and, and puts in a boat shop there on uh, uh, some island close to Ketchikan. And then he has the same problem. He, he, he's unable to get the title to his, um, his possessions. Many A and B members were initially hesitant to move forward on land claims. I guess it was, a, again, it was uh, conflicting with being a citizen and there was a little uneasiness about uh, engaging in, in that practice because then you're not an American citizen if you're engaging in a land claim or claiming land. So the idea probably uh, didn't catch on immediately, but uh, I, I am assuming that the more they thought about it, they begin to realize maybe there was merit to the idea. But in 1929, at an A&B convention in Haines, it was resolved that the Clinket and Haida Indians should seek compensation for the loss of Aboriginal title to the land. William Paul was one of the many members who made a major contribution to the Brotherhood's success. And as you read history, Bill Paul is, is tremendously involved, uh, starting newspapers, trying to create the union, uh, going back to Washington, and uh, being available to draft letters. And uh, he was a spark plug or the catalyst that gave the organization its, its current, its, its reputation uh, being a powerful entity. And you have to appreciate that, that the founding fathers with their um, uh, education, grade school education, uh, recognized that they needed him or people like him with that type of education to help them pursue their goals. The Alaska Native Brotherhood established the Central Council to pursue the Clinket and Haida lawsuit. John Borbridge, former president of Central Council in Sea Alaska. The Central Council was established by the Alaska Native Brotherhood for the purpose of dealing with all of the matters that uh, came before the a &B as a consequence of the Clinket and Haida lawsuit. The a &B established the practice of, of either adjourning or uh, recessing, and they would then constitute themselves as a central organization, at which time they would take care of all the matters that would come before it. In 1968, after years of political and legal struggles, we were awarded seven and a half million dollars as recovery of compensations for land wrongfully lost. The commissioner set a sum of 15 million, he said, and he recommended that this be the settlement that the Tlingonites were entitled to. The full bench of the Court of Claims decided that Tlingonites should be entitled to a settlement of 7.5 million. 
this amounted to shattering the dreams that, uh, that people who had s supported that effort all these years now were asked to forget about 80 million, forget about 57 million, and accept seven and a half million. There was anger, there was frustration, there was a feeling of deep resentment and passionate resistance to any suggestion that we accept that settlement. After intensive debate, a special convention of the Central Council voted not to appeal the award. The uh, reasons that uh, I advanced to the Executive Committee as President of the Central Council, and which we subsequently advanced to the convention, was this. Number one, many of the elders who had, during their lifetime, supported the klingen Haida effort, which was in fact uh, funded by the contributions of the people, uh, many of these uh, elders were passing on without ever realizing any benefits from the uh, klingen Haida Judgment Award. Uh, two, the statewide land claims was looming on the horizon. And in the personal vein, I'd always had a dream of land for the klingen Haidas. But under the existing law, there was no way in the world that uh, we could realize that uh, dream of land for the Tlingit Haidas, except through a statewide land claims. And so the thought was that by accepting the award now, we would have the use of the money now to strengthen our infrastructure and to enable the Central Council to function as an active lobbying entity in Juneau and Washington, D.C., in representing the well-being of the Tlingit Haidas. After accepting the $7.5 million judgment, the Central Council immediately pursued unsettled land claims by joining the Alaska Federation of Natives. The Alaska Federation of Natives had uh, requested that a bill be filed on behalf of the Alaska Natives seeking a Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. This uh, required uh, lobbying through the Congress of the United States. The Tlingen Haidas, realizing that we had unsettled uh, land claims that had not been addressed by the Court of Claims, also realized that uh, in order to have that resolved, our best bet would be to join the statewide effort, the Alaska Federation of Natives, and seek one comprehensive and uh, complete settlement by the Congress of the United States they went on to accomplishing one of the most active lobbying efforts Washington, D.C. has ever seen. The lobbying effort by the Native people was lauded by observers in the Congress and in uh, other places in uh, Washington, D.C., in the White House, for example, who cited the effort by the Alaska Natives in lobbying for a land claim settlement as one of the most sophisticated and dedicated and effective they had uh, witnessed. On December 18, 1971, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act became law. We had simply been Alaska Natives dealing with our problem best as we could. We're overnight shareholders in corporations that became business for car profit corporations provided for under an act of Congress and chartered by under state law. So a mix of all these feelings just uh, swept through us. We had been so focused on gaining passage of a fair and equitable act, now we had to focus on how are we going to make it work. The act provided for title to some 44 million acres, financial compensation of $962.5 million, and promised to protect native subsistence. Indians in Southeast received over 400,000 national forest acres and more than $200 million. Once the act was signed into law, Sea Alaska was formed. Uh, once the act was uh, passed, then it was necessary for Sea Alaska to immediately organize itself and to prepare to receive its uh, charter from the state of Alaska 
as a business for profit uh, corporation. Then we had to immediately prepare for uh, the employment of uh, attorney, an in-house attorney, engineer, uh, a CPA and other similar high level type of expertise. We had to prepare for actual land selections, which meant uh, generating as much information that was available as uh, possible. We had to have our attorneys continue to uh, analyze uh, the provisions of ANCSA. It was one thing to seek passage of the Act, another thing to determine how we viewed the interpretation of the provisions and how uh, members of the various uh, federal and state agencies uh, viewed their uh, responsibilities. With the passage of ANCSA, the role of Central Council changed from advocacy of land claims to providing services to Clinkett and Haida Indians. Ed Thomas, president of Clinkett and Haida Central Council. In the beginning, the Clinkett people and the Haida people were two distinct Indian nations. They joined together to, to uh, file a suit against the federal government over the taking of the Tongass National Forest and the Glacier Bay National, National Monument. Uh, since then, since gaining recognition, the tribe has gotten more involved in uh, the management of the programs that are designed to benefit its members. This change in the Central Council's focus came about at a time when federal programs were becoming available for tribal management. Uh, the Buy Indian Act was the very first act uh, that Congress passed to uh, provide an opportunity for tribes to manage programs. In 1975, they passed the Indian Self-Determination Act, uh, which uh, made it a little stronger uh, by not only uh, saying you have the opportunity, but uh, uh, making it so that the federal agencies had to make it possible for the tribes to manage their own programs. That evolved into a self-governance uh, program where uh, we uh, actually can uh, get involved in negotiating certain uh, parts of the administration of the BIA. To make more federal dollars available to Southeast Indians, the council dissolved a portion of the BIA's administration. We came to the conclusion that uh, the federal agencies had too many layers of administration for the small amount of programs that were administered to our people. And uh, so we felt that either we had to get out of managing the programs to get rid of one layer of administration, or we had to reduce the federal government's layers of administration. We chose the latter. We completely abolished the Southeast Agency, converted, converted those programs, I mean those administrative dollars into program dollars. And we also took our fair share of the BIA administration um, uh, within the total area, or what's now called the region, and converted those into programs for the people. Another key focus for the council has been preserving and enhancing tribal status at a national level. Clinkett and Haida, uh, through its participation in national forums like the National Congress of American Indians, has uh, <coughs> advocated for and supported uh, the government-to-government uh, -government relationship uh, uh, with the federal government. Uh, and we have used that uh, commitment in dealing with our congressional delegates in Congress, uh, which has been very effective in uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the federal government respects the government-to-government -government relationship with uh, the people. Probably the most important vehicle, however, is dealing with the President of the United States itself. In our progress as a people, A&B, Central Council, and C. Alaska have each made enormous contributions. As we enter this new millennium, these organizations will continue to serve us well. Bob Losher, President of C. Alaska Corporation. What the Sea Alaska Corporation and the Central Council of the Clinkett Haida Indians and the Alaska Native Brotherhood have done is taken our inheritance from our land claims and enabled us to convert that into not only economic opportunity, 
but social and political and economic opportunities that can be converted for use for individual shareholders as well as our shareholders as a group. This opportunity, united with the strength of our past, will help us continue to thrive as a people. The uh, variety of experiences that our people have had over the past century has uh, created a situation where now I think that we can uh, go forward in providing the best services possible to our people while doing what we can to preserve the good parts of our culture. The, uh, the beauty of it, the, uh, uh, the strengths of the language, all those things uh, will be tested and uh, I think we have a responsibility to make sure uh, those things are under consideration as we move forward. We have a great tradition of trade and commerce. Clinkets and Haidas and Simpson people traded from the North Slope all the way to the California in, in the thousand years that preceded this time. And going forward, we're able to take that, that same tradition and launch it around the world. And more and more we find that the cultural uh, history and tradition of our people is, gives us great strength in dealing with other cultures around the world in Asia and in Europe, North America, South America, where we're doing business. And those kind of values, those kinds of traditions give, the, give us very much of an edge in the world economy. And I think we'll do really well by respecting our culture and blending that with our business way into the future. We are the Clinket and Haida Indians, entering a new millennium, a time of rapid change and great opportunity. If we draw from our heritage to face the challenges of this new age, we will succeed today, tomorrow, and beyond.